My name's Bob Darrell, and I'm alcoholic. <laughs> and only through the grace of a God that I was afraid to believe in, that I've accessed and maintained in my life through a process outlined in a book called Alcoholics Anonymous, an ability to remain reasonably sponsorable, and a persistent and consistent effort in the primary purpose of helping another drunk, so I haven't had a drink or any mind or emotion altering substance since October 31st, 1978. And, and that is and remains the great miracle in my life, least I forget it. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the members of the committee for inviting me here. It's a privilege. You got a, guys got a great turnout. I didn't think there was that many sick people in this area. Uh, evidently, I was wrong. Uh, I want to welcome the new people. Glad you're here. Especially Patrick got the book. Got the. I'm, feel like my talk's going like that, you know, it's just, um, yeah, P- Patrick, welcome, you're, uh, this isn't like anything else, there's no other place on the planet that'll give you a, bring you up and give you a gift for burning your life to the ground recently, <laughs> we're glad you're here, keep coming back, it hurts, uh, and anyone else that's new, I'm glad you're here, uh, this alcoholism really and truly is baffling. It's insidious, it's cunning, it talks to you almost constantly, and the great trick it does is it makes it think that it's you. And when I was new in in Alcoholics Anonymous back in 1978, I was having one of those bad days that guys like me have. You know those kind of days where you can see the end of the world coming? One of those kind of days and boss doesn't like me, I can tell by his body language, and I I read minds, I know they're thinking stuff about me, you know, I just, no, I didn't, and I, I the people in AA, I don't, you know, they're nice to me, but I think their sponsors are just making them do that, you know, and I, I don't know, doubting whether there really is a God, and I, I, I don't feel very good, and I'm, I'm fighting depression, and I, sort of had this brain tumor I could feel growing in my head and and this thing is just chattering to me all the time and it's never good news you ever notice that my head doesn't have come up with good news it's just always this doomsday chatter and I, I'm talk I'm telling this old timer all this crap I'm thinking is crazy stuff and he says oh, you you think that that's that your your mind your thoughts don't you? I said, well, yeah, they're I, my mind, my thought, yeah. He said, you're not that. What you are is you're the idiot that listens to that stuff. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's not me. I'm the guy. It's, it, I'm the guy that it works over. And boy, when I got first got sober, prior, that's why we all we all come to the table eventually with the steps here. Because if, if I'm a member, an everyday member of Alcoholics Anonymous, because of the membership requirement in the third tradition, where it says membership should include all who suffer from alcoholism. If I don't do Alcoholics Anonymous and I remain sober, I will start to suffer from alcoholism. And I will, it will angst up more and more and more until eventually I will go get some medication. I will take a drink. I'll do something. But I have a disease that demands treatment. You know, Anna was telling the story about how her, after she didn't go to meetings for a while, and her boy said, boyfriend said, yeah, you got to go to meetings. Uh, I got sober one time. I was living with this gal and she was paying the rent. She had a car and a job and I had nothing. And, that sort of looks like love to me. <laughs> and uh, she gave me an ultimatum. She said, you got to quit drinking or you're out of here. And I don't have anywhere to go. And I, and inside me, I'm thinking, oh, my God, if I lose her. Then we'll... I felt so decrepit and like, worthless. I thought nobody would ever be with me. You know, I thought, you know this, all those feelings. And so I got, I got sober. I swore off and I meant it. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink. After about three weeks, she said, the, the, the 
most beautiful thing I've ever heard. She said, I liked you better when you were drinking. I didn't say it, but I thought, me too. Me too, yes. I mean, we're both on the same page about this. I felt close to her. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And that's alcoholism. And I'm either going to treat it with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous or I'm going to treat it with a drink, but I'm going to treat it one way or another. It is an itch that must be scratched. And I didn't know that. I didn't know what was wrong with me when I got sober. I, I came, I, I, I've had this disease. I don't know if I've had it all my life, but I'll tell you, I never went through a social period of drinking. I took my first drink. I was almost 13 years old and I just shot right into alcoholism. I, I mean, from the very first time I ever felt the effect of alcohol, it lit something up inside of me that just went, oh yeah. Like, like as if I've been going around this planet for over a dozen years and something was desperately missing. Oh, and it ain't missing no more. And you know, you know, you feel it in every cell of your body. You feel that feeling. Oh, we're, we're going to do this a lot. This is very cool. Oh my God. This is really very cool. And it was an amazing treatment for a sickness that I didn't even know I had. But I think I had alcoholism before I ever picked up a drink. I, I must have been like a freeze-dried alcoholic waiting for alcohol. <laughs> and the reason I think that is that I was so I was self-centered. I was wrapped up in myself. I was overly sensitive. I worried. I'm a little kid. But what am I worrying about? I'm worried about everything. I'm, I used to, I remember this science class, they were talking about the end of the world and how eventually the galaxy was going to blow up and all this. Like, oh my God, you know, I just worry about stuff. I, what you're thinking is a big piece of business with me. I'm always wondering what you're thinking. And I, I don't feel very, I don't fit very well. And so before I ever picked up a drink, I became what, the guy that talks about in chapter 6 in the book, that, where it says, more than most people, the alcoholic tends to live a double life. We create this stage character. And I did that even as a little kid, but I didn't even know I was doing it. I just don't feel like other people look, so I become a pretend guy. I become the guy who pretends he's not afraid, and I'm afraid a lot. I become the guy who pretends he's tough, and I'm not tough. I become the guy who pretends like he fits, and, and I don't really fit. I, I'm desperate to fit, but I don't really fit. I become the guy who pretends he's okay, and the truth is, I am not okay. And that's my big secret. And so you gotta pretend, and, and you know how that is, man, you're all, if you're like me, you can't really pretend enough. I'm always coming from behind. I got, it seems like I gotta act a little bit louder and a little tougher and a little just just to feel equal to the other kids, not to be better than them. And I can't ever really get there. And where's there? There's what I see in you. And I think that's all I ever wanted, was to be connected with you and to feel like you looked. Because it seemed like everybody in the world just, they were good. And then there's me. When I was uh, almost 13 years old, hanging around a bunch of older kids, <clears throat> Broke into a house, um, just wanted to fit. Bro, I would have done anything. You know, I'd have, if they'd have given me a gun, I probably would have shot somebody if they told me to. I'd have done anything just to fit. I wanted their approval so bad. These were the, the kids were older than me. They were, these were the tough kids in the neighborhood. These kids had some kind of power that I wanted so desperately. The power that when they walk down the hall, the other kids got out of the way. Oh my God. When you're secretly pathetic and weak and afraid all the time, that's amazing. I want that. I don't want to be the guy that's afraid all the time. I want to be the guy that people are afraid of. And so I, I, we pulled this little burglary and one of the things we stole was some bottles of whiskey. I didn't know nothing about it. I didn't come from an alcoholic family. Uh, I came from a, a, actually a very wonderful childhood, great family. The problem is I was in it. I mean, it was... (laughs) 
My parents loved me all they could, but I was so self-centered I couldn't feel it. You couldn't. I was a black hole of love. You can't love me enough. Love you can just love me, love me, love me. <laughs> Is that all you got? <laughs> you can't. Isn't it funny? We come into Alcoholics Anonymous, you start sponsoring people, and you start caring about them. And an amazing thing happens. You start to feel the way you imagined if the right people loved you the right way. And it's never from you giving it to me. It's from me giving it to you. I never knew that. Uh, Because I was too self-centered to really care about anybody except me. And worrying about me and caring about me was a full-time job. And I we I get this bottles of whiskey and I take a couple hits off this bottle of Seagram 7. And when it stopped burning, something started to happen to me that was just so amazing. I I often believe, I I think that if, if sometime in your drinking... Alcohol didn't do that magical set you free. All of a sudden you feel like they look and this is an amazing. If it doesn't do that for you at some point, you're not going to let it do to you later what it's going to do to you if you're not chasing what it did for you. And I, it did something for me that was so spectacular. I, I, I'd throw away everything chasing that feeling, chasing that, that medicine that as the years went on, seemed not to work much anymore. And, and that's the problem with alcoholism. It, it's, it's a progressive illness. I think every alcoholic I've ever known, if you could, if you could have maintained the effect that you got when you were first started drinking and continued to drink like that, even though you get in trouble, it'd be worth it, wouldn't it? I mean, what's a, what's, What's 30 days in jail once in a while for, you know, once in a while? I mean, what's that? That's nothing compared to being, being at the guy at the party. And I loved it. I loved it. And as the years went on, my ability to obtain that magical effect seemed to get more elusive. And I, I was a child of the 70s, so we, we, we were chemically well-balanced people. Um, <laughs> You know, we did every. I was in a. I was in a band. This is so pathetic. I, I am actually going back to a conference. I, I, one of the most exciting things I get to do is in next month I get to go to a little tiny nothing AA conference in a little town in Pennsylvania. But it's the town where I did all my drinking, and I got unmade amends back there. And they're not unmade because I'm not willing. They're unmade because I've never been able to find the people because I don't know their last name. And I'm going back there hoping, maybe, God willing. There's a woman somewhere back there, if she's still, I don't know. She was the band leader of a band I was in. And nice, nice gal. Not not one of us. Nice, normal, sort of. And she she uh, entered, She needed uh, somebody to play in her band with her and her and her other people. She had a vacancy. And I, inter- I interview well. Good. She, she really thought I was everything she was looking for. And sober, I wasn't too bad. I wasn't, I wasn't great, but I was okay sober. And she books, hires me and books this tour, right? Well, the problem is the tour is like VFW halls and Elks halls and these bars where if you're in the band, you can drink for free. Oh, you can't do that to me. Oh, that's horrid because I'm a pig. I'll get there two hours early just because it's free. And I'm the, I, I'm the guy that is, I remember, I have one horrid memory. You know how you get those blackouts and you don't really, it's not really a full blackout. You, me, you remember little bits and pieces of it. I remember bits and pieces of being on the stage trying to start the second set and knocking over mic stands and falling into the drum set. <laughs> and then I got another memory of being shaken awake, uh, in a booth in this bar. And, and so this whole, this poor lady, had invested all this in this tour and, and, uh, she's a middle class housewife from a suburban area and it, she got a second job and the second job was to find drug dealers to sell her speed or diet pills for me so she can count on me not passing out before the night's over. Right? And I never did get the, I've never found her to make amends. But that's the kind of alcoholic I am. I'm the kind of drunk that I, if I'm still conscious, 
I ain't done drinking. I got that allergy. I didn't know, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to define. You know, I came, I started coming into Alcoholics Anonymous back in the days when I was doing a lot of other stuff also and counselors would say things to you like, well, what's your drug of choice? That's a hard thing to answer. <laughs> well, what do you got? I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, I drank vanilla extract a couple times. I, I, I broke I, in jail one time. I broke open a magic marker and huffed it, hoping something might happen. You know, I, what they should ask you, they should say to find out if you have this terminal illness that is all encompassing. There have been a lot of drug addicts that can drink, but there's never been an alcoholic that can socially use anything else. And with the question they should ask you to find out if I have this terminal, al this disease called alcoholism, is, is that, is, ask me about the litmus test that Dr. Silkworth has discovered that seems to define us and differentiate us as a, as a unique, distinct disease or entity. Bob, when you start to drink, do you have an allergic reaction to alcohol that you can't really see, but as you, as you feel the effect of the alcohol, do you break out in an irresistible yearning for more? I've always had that. I have never once not had that reaction to alcohol. I, I can't tell you one time in all the years I was partying, being in some guy's basement, smoking some stuff, drinking wine, been in a bar with my buddy, shooting pool, shots and beers for about an hour, had the bartender say, hey, Bob, would you like another drink? I do not know what it is to sit there and think to myself honestly, I, I think I'm good, thanks. I'm, <laughs> I don't know. I've never had that experience. It's always one more, one more, you know, it's... And, and I got that. And I have this thing called alcoholism. Well, the great, the greatest trick alcoholism does is convince you you ain't got it. And, and I didn't know that I had that for years. I, I, this just sounds pathetic. It was probably four, maybe five, I don't know, treatment centers before. Maybe it was a couple years, two, three years, two years, maybe three years of going back out again, hoping to control and enjoy this deal, and failing before it got beaten into me by the results that I'm reaping, that I got that thing you guys talk about. I got that. I couldn't have put it into words. I hadn't read the doctor's opinion. I couldn't have said phenomena craving. couldn't have said allergy, allergy to alcohol. I couldn't have said it. But I knew that if I take one, I can't stop I knew that. And I thought, to my demise, I thought knowing that, now that I get, I get it, I get it. That knowing that coupled with a really sincere determination to be done with it and never drink again, because I'm not stupid, I get that I'm ruining my life here. I get that there are guys I went to high school with that own homes and I'm like sleeping on people's couches and stuff. I mean, I get it. And I think I'm out of the woods because I got the knowledge. See, I think knowledge is power. But knowledge isn't power. There's one who has all power. And if there's one who has all power, there's no knowledge. In, there's no power in knowledge. I, I was so obsessed with knowledge that I thought if I knew enough, I could beat this thing. But I went to school, became an alcoholism drug abuse counselor. <laughs> I, I was very good at it right up to the day I lost the job for being drunk on the job. I, <laughs> Hardly enough, in, in next month in May, I'm going to talk at the place that fired me. I'm, I'm so delighted about that. <laughs> I am so delighted. I just, they asked me, would you like to do an H&I meeting there? I said, are you kidding me? Oh my God, I'd pay to do that. <laughs> oh. See, knowledge isn't power. There's alcoholics as we sit here tonight, drinking themselves to death that know, that know everything you could ever know about this disease. But it's not in the mind. Recovery is only in the feet. There was a, a, a wonderful man, uh, Frank Honeycutt, who used to say that recovery is not for those who need it 
we all know that. I, we, everybody in this room probably knows someone. Oh my God, they need this. They're dying. But they don't get it, do they? It's tragic. And Frank said, it's not only not for those who need it, it's not even for those who want it. I, I've, for many, many years, I've taken a meeting into a Skid Row detox in Las Vegas twice a week and across the street from the detox is this big old oak tree and guys, a lot of detox is full most of the time, so guys sit under that tree, desperate. So there's guys that have died under that tree because they went into convulsions and split their head open. And we used to call it the dying tree. I, I stopped and talked to guys under that tree, sitting under there, waiting, hoping, sick, sick. They've, ru- they've burnt their life to the ground. And they'll tell you, sobbing with tears of sincerity as if they couldn't be any more sincere how much they want this. And they never get it. And they never get it because Frank says it's only for those who do it. And so you can want it and you can need it, but if you don't do it, you don't get it. And that's the problem. Because I'm not a doer. I'm a thinker. (laughs) I'm a ponderer. I'm an analyzer, I'm a wonderer, and I'm a noticer. That's one of my problems with AA. I'm a noticer. I notice. I've been looking at it, I noticed tonight there's some of you that are really out of line. I can just tell. I'm I'm, I'm that guy. I, I just get it. You know, I... You know, I walk into I walk into an A meeting, just be sitting there. Everything's okay, till the noticer clicks on, and I, I'll notice how many cups of coffee you drank and how much money you put in the basket. I'll listen to you share, and I'll notice that you're really full of crap. You're not really like that. And see, I live up in here. And the rest of the world's out here. Alcoholism is a lonely, lonely business. And as the years went on and the disease progressed, I, I, I didn't know what was happening to me. I, you know, the trouble gets worse and worse, and I can't seem to get the fun back that, that I had at one time. And I don't know why. Why this magical effect and this feeling and getting lit up like I used to is is becoming something I can't seem to grasp anymore, and I used to, and I'm throwing all these drugs in the mix, trying to jumpstart the party, and it ain't jumpstarting. And I don't know what's wrong with me. And uh, it's it's a it's a hit. It's it's like almost like you know when you're a young kid and you first start drinking. It's so cool, but every time you go out to party with your buddies, it's like spinning a roulette wheel, and you spin the roulette wheel, and it's coming up amazing stuff. Drag racing, singing with your buddies, fighting, but you can't feel it, so it's very cool. Uh, dancing, dancing, you can't, I can't dance sober, you get me lit up, the rhythm of the universe flows through me. <laughs> dancing, talking to girls, get, get laid, oh my god. I'm telling you, if it wasn't for alcohol, I'd be celibate to this day. I mean, it's just, oh, oh, how am I ever gonna, I'm too insecure, I'm too, you kidding me? Oh. Oh, jeez. And there's a little... You spin the wheel. Once in a while, some bad stuff will come up. You know, some throwing up. You know, when you you ran out of stuff to mix it with and all you had was scotch and root beer. That's a bad... Mm. So once in a while, you're throwing up and arresting. Get an arrested. But you're, you get out of it. You're young. You get out of it. It's not a big deal. And as the years went on, it's as if some hideous force starts screwing with the wheel and they start taking off some of the good stuff and putting things up like wet pants that's <laughs> that's not good i'll tell you if you're if you're 2 years old diaper rash might be cute when you're 20 it is not cute <laughs> getting more and more arrested lost jobs that look you start seeing that look oh that look is bad it's a bad look I bet you most of you have seen it. You see it sometimes in your mother or father or your husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend. Sometimes the worst place to see it is in your kids. That look of... of con- it's kind of like a blend of pity and contempt. It's a bad look. 
I started having blackouts and I, I had, I got it. It was almost like blackouts became a daily way of life with me. I mean, I, I can't, I didn't even know they were blackouts for a while. I, I would not know where my car was. I wouldn't know how I got home. I just, I thought maybe I was just so deep in thought. I, you know. <laughs> One of my early, the earliest, one of the first rehabs I ever went to, a guy said, asked me, he's interviewing, he said, so do you have blackouts? I said, I don't remember any blackouts. He said, that's why they call them blackouts. <laughs> and, and my blackouts became, were starting to become hideous. It, it's like I never did anything good in a blackout. Nobody ever came up to me the next day and said, oh my God, Bob, you were so helpful last night. <laughs> You peed in our kitchen. <laughs> you threw up in my living room. You busted my lamp. You, you hit on my wife. You stole my stash. You sideswiped my car. You passed out my front lawn. The, the most hideous one. I wish I could find this guy. I don't even, I, I don't know. I, I was on my way to a, the liquor store. They don't open until 10 a.m. in Pennsylvania, which is cruel and unusual punishment. If you, if you come to it 2 a.m. and need a drink, you gotta, you just, that's a lot of pacing. <laughs> And I'm finally, I'm getting, I gotta get to that liquor store at 9.30. You know, you gotta get down there early and stand out in front of those windows and look as pathetic as you can, hoping they open early. They never open early. And I'm on my way there, on a mission, get to that liquor store, and get a bottle of wine, and I need, I need some medicine, man, cause I'm like this, I'm coming apart. This guy on the street cuts into me, says, you know you told everybody last night you beat Bruce Lee in a karate match? <laughs> Shoot me. What's your, I mean, this is hideous. Now, I'm doing things when I drink that I hate myself for. So now, I'm in this perpetual motion machine. I'm drinking over my drinking, which causes me to do more bizarre stuff. It's, it's a bad deal. And I can't get out. And I can't get out, not because I don't want to get out. There's something else wrong with me, and I don't understand what it is. See, I, I'm confused here because I, I'm getting that the problem is alcohol and then other stuff to mix, thrown in the mix, of course. Yeah, it's all, it's all problematic. Yeah, yeah. I get it. But why do I go back to it? Why is it that I swear to myself and mean it with everything in me? And I, cause I, and I get it. I'm never going back there and I always eventually go back there. And it's not only is it baffling to me, I think it's baffling to everybody else around me. They don't understand. Because I don't just I, I don't just burn my life to the ground just randomly. It's usually when things were better than the like when I'm sober several months and everybody's going I got a good job and a girlfriend and a car people are going, Oh, Bob's turned the corner. And I turn it again right back to hell every single time. And and if you're like me, especially if you're new. You know, by the time you get to AA, there have been, I would assume, a quite a few people who have had talks with you <laughs> about you. Maybe your minister, maybe your priest, maybe your mother, father, maybe your girlfriend, boyfriend, maybe your wife, husband, maybe your kids, maybe maybe your therapist, maybe your counselor. You get real bad, maybe your drug dealer's been having talks to you about you. <laughs> Maybe strangers on the street are starting to say, hey, you're really messed up, you know. Uh, and they all say the same thing. They all say, Bob, you're really messed up. You're really screwed up. If you catch me on a day that my, I'm demoralized and my defense mechanisms aren't in play, I'll probably agree with you. I'll probably go, yeah, I know. And there's such a despair in that acknowledgement because I know I am. I am. And then they'll always say, well, do you know why you're so screwed up? Oh my God, by this time I'd been in, I'd had so many therapists. I've tried, you know, I've tried to figure it out and I don't know. And they say, they'll tell you. They'll say, well, you're, the reason you're screwed up is you keep getting screwed up. If you didn't keep getting screwed up, you wouldn't be so screwed up. And if you wouldn't be so screwed up, you wouldn't be so screwed up. So I'm pretty screwed up. I think, okay, I'm not going to get screwed up. And when I don't get screwed up, I get so screwed up. I got to go get screwed up. <laughs> And guys are sitting there and they get in your face. You know, you're screwed up. Yeah, I know. Because I think the problem is alcohol. And what I don't understand is if you're an acute alcoholic, if you're a problem drinker, that's probably true. 
If you're, uh, if you don't have chronic alcoholism and you have acute alcoholism, you just need a one step program recovery. Just step one. Cut it out. Stop. You're good to go. But I got this insidious, hideous disease called alcoholism and it, from the moment I put the drink down, slowly, in, incrementally, it just starts gnawing away at me. And it just starts working at me. And, you know, it's everything that it talks about on page 52 is what I experience in abstinence. Everything that Silkworth says when he says that we're restless, irritable, discontent, unless we can again experience that ease and comfort which we'd once found in taking a few drinks. And and I'm the guy who the, the book says we're prey to misery and depression, a feeling of uselessness, full of fear, can't seem to make a living, problem with personal relationships, on and on. I'm all of that. I'm the guy when I quit drinking, I get, I'm very depressed. I, I don't fit anywhere, and I try, but I, I'm so awkward about it. I, you know, I, I feel like I'm in a world of John Wayne's, and I'm Pee Wee Herman or something. I, uh, I try to be cool. I try to fit, and I just, I don't, I ain't good at it. I'm so, I, I'm a recluse when I get sober. I'm, you know, I, I, I was sober one time about eight months. And what I did from the time I woke up in the morning till the time TV used to go off the air, you'd hear this in the national anthem, I'd just sit in front of the television set. And I was good in front of the television set, like the television's like Valium with a plug. you just just sit there and zone out. But man, I couldn't be around people. I couldn't be around people because I don't know how to talk to you sober. I don't know how to fit. And I'm so depressed when I'm around you because... Everything I observe in you depresses me because it just points out in stark relief everything I'm not. And so I uh, I get sober and I try with everything in me not to drink again. And, and this alcoholism, this restless, irritable discontent just slowly undermines this. It, it, it's, it just goes right below the horizon and just sort of gnaws away at the foundation of my abstinence day in and day out. You know what it's like? I saw this in a movie 30 years ago. It, and this was such a... I, when I watched this, I thought, oh my God, that's alcoholism. Exactly. That's what happened to me time and time and time again. And it was a, a movie about the, the communists in the Cold War. And these communists had captured a CIA agent. And he was, a, I guess, a spy. And he had some kind of information about some new airplane, some new weapon. And these guys were, these communists are hell-bent on torturing those secrets out of this guy. But he's a tough CIA-trained guy. And so they've had him strapped in a chair, and they've been torturing him for a week or so. They've hit him with fire hoses. They've beat him with rubber hoses. They even brought this generator in. And with this, these two wires, they touch them, they spark. And they put them on the guy's private parts. And he withered in agony and pain for a couple days. And he still didn't tell him anything. Amazing. Because I'm the guy you just show the wires to. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm, I'm caving here. I mean, I might try to act tough on those streets. You just hit the spark those in front of my face. And I'm just, what do you want? I'm giving, you know, I'm giving it up. This guy would not give nothing up. Tough CIA trained guy. Finally, this little Dr. Chan comes in. And he bows and he says, my name's Dr. Chan. You will tell me everything. This macho American spy says, screw you, Doc. I ain't telling you nothing. There's nothing you can do to me to get me to talk. What are you going to do? You're going to beat me more? You're going to stab me? You're going to electrocute me? You've done it all. He says, no. We give you Chinese water torture. He says, water torture? When you hit me with a fire hose? You already did that, Doc. I ain't telling you nothing. He says, no fire hose, one drop. He says, one drop. Talk, hit me with a bucket of water. I don't care. I ain't telling you nothing. He says, no bucket, one drop. And he's laughing. The guy says, this talk, you're crazy. And they reel this apparatus in. They put it above his head. He's strapped to that chair. It just starts. <laughs> I ain't telling you nothing. <laughs> you're getting me to give you nothing. <laughs> And 
And after three days, he's begging them to please let him tell them everything he knows, if you'll just make it stop. And he can't understand why a drop of water would break him when all that other stuff wouldn't. And I can't understand in the light of my commitment to never drink again and the knowledge of what I've done just did to myself and what I always do to myself when I drink again, that these vague yet almost unrecognizable emotions this restless, irritable discontent, this, this, this mild depression, this low level, that isn't, couldn't possibly get me to drink again in the light of what I know and my commitment to, but it just works on you. Day in, day out, week in, week out, until there comes a point or I can't see anything. I can't see the last drunk. I can't see my swearing to myself with tears in my eyes. I'm never going to drink again. I can't see the promises. I can only see one thing and one thing only. And that is the desperate need, the yearning to just bust out because I'm so tired of being locked up in here with all these crazy thoughts and emotions. And I don't even understand them. And if you ask me what's wrong, it's like, I don't know. Nothing really. Nothing really. And yet everything. And nothing really. Yet nothing's right. And I don't understand it. And, and I just, I don't, I don't get the obsession to drink. I get the obsession for freedom. And you know, isn't it funny, this alcoholic mind that I have will never let me see the truth. Silkworth says it, he says we can't, after a while, we can't differentiate the true from the false. When I'm suffering from alcoholism, I can't see reality. I can't see that the last four times I went on a run, it had been pathetic. That I drank and felt sorry for myself. I drank and went on crying jags. I drank and at four o'clock in the morning, I'm calling up people I went to grade school with because I'm so lonely. And, and I, <laughs> that I don't bathe anymore after, you know, I, I can't see that. What I see is all the fun days that were five years, ten years before, five years before. And my alcoholic mind yearns for the medicine so desperately it won't let me see the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. All I can see is the hope of relief and freedom. I can't see nothing else. I can't see nothing else. They used to say in treatment centers, well, the thought comes about drinking. Think it through. I just hurry up to the liquor store. I mean, I just, I get, yeah, thinking it through. Yeah, boy, but I better got it going quicker now. See, I got a mind. I have no mental defense against this thing. No mental defense. Because of a disease called alcoholism. And I, I went to, a lot of therapy and a lot of treat. My mother, uh, God, my I had some amazing parents. They were very, they they spent a fortune. They spent a life savings trying to help me. My mother uh, was actually a therapist for mental health and mental retardation in Pennsylvania. She worked for MHMR, and just because of her and my father's political connections, I got to go to therapy with some of the greatest in the world. <laughs> Is that an angel getting his wings? <laughs> and it never helped me. I under, when, when that part of the book when it talks about uh, Roland Hazard going to the Carl Jung, which Carl Jung was the top of the food chain for treatment in those days. And Jung said something brilliant to him. After working with him for a year in therapy at his clinic and Switzerland, he said, and he drank again, he said, there's nothing, nothing I or anybody on this planet can do for you. And, and, and I get that. In the ABCs, it says, A, we must be convinced that we are alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. Did you ever notice there's a period there? I thought it said, and could not manage our own lives when I was drinking. But now that I'm sober, well, let me at it. I'm good. I'm, I can think clearly now. That's the problem. 
The fog is lifted and the airplanes are starting to land. It's not good. This is not good. That's the worst thing a sponsee says to me. He's about three months sober and he says, I'm starting to think clearly. Oh, buckle in. Oh, oh. We gotta get you, we gotta get you more involved. (laughs) Quick. Because the beast has awoken. And I, uh, I didn't think it was alcoholism. And the reason, I go to AA meetings, and the reason I don't think it's alcoholism, even though I must eat, I must concede that I have a problem with alcohol, for sure. I mean, for God's sakes, I got DUIs, of course. But my real problem isn't what's wrong, isn't alcoholism, because I go to your meetings, and I look at you, and I listen to you, and I watch you. I've done this for years. And you guys, here's what I see. You guys, you're nice people. You're always kind to me. And you quit drinking and you, you kind of find God and go to some meetings and you become wonderful. I mean, for God's sake, people on AA were, seemed like they were grateful for everything. I don't even like anything. I don't like me. You're grateful for, and you love everybody. People, they used to say things like, if no one told you today that they love you, I want you to know I love you and I wouldn't say nothing, but I think, I hate you. <laughs> I don't love you. I'd like to know where you live and when you weren't, aren't going to be home. <laughs> and I see, I'm comparing what I feel like with raw, untreated alcoholism with a spiritual malady. See, when I quit drinking, I start to get sick inside. And I don't know it. I don't know it. But I start to get sick inside. I, I become judgmental. I'm the guy who picks people apart. I had a psych. I one of the, I, one of the things I didn't understand. People would talk about me having an ego problem, and I can't believe I have an ego problem because I have no self-esteem. I secretly loathe myself. I mean, and you would too, for God's sakes. If if someone else had done to my loved ones. And to me, what I had done to my loved ones, and to me, I'd want them dead. I'd hate them. I'd want to kill them. So, so when you say I have an ego problem, it's like, no, I don't, no, that doesn't, I'm not, no, that doesn't apply to me. I feel very, very bad. I have a low ego. What I had low was self-esteem. And I had a tremendous ego that grew up to compensate for these secret feelings of self-loathing. And I didn't know that inside me that I would be so, I'd get sober and I'd be so desperate to feel better that I'd always do things to feed my ego. See, I'm a relief seeker. I don't want to change. I want relief. And relief is all about the ego. You know, I want, I want attention. I want to get laid. I want a good job. I want money. I want toys. I want, I want prestige. It's me, 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 me. I'm like the, this vacuum going through life, desperately trying to fill up my vacancies. And the odd thing about that is that this is a hole that you more, the more you put into it, the bigger the hole gets. It doesn't fill. It just gets emptier and more vacant. And I don't know that. I don't know that, that I'm, I'm, I'm on this losing course. And, and I, a psychiatrist, a great psychiatrist in Pennsylvania, a guy who's worked now over 50 years in the field of alcoholism, he's also a rabbi, Abe Torsky. I was in, I was in three places he was involved with over the, over those years. He nailed me at one place. He, he said to me, he said, you're, you're going to relapse yourself to death. And he says, guys like you, you don't get any better. Oh, you may stay sober even for years, maybe a decade or so, but you never recover. You never get any better. He says the reason you don't get any better is that you're so ego dominant, even though you have no self-esteem, that you can't listen or observe anything in order to learn something new. You can only listen to see how you're already right. Oh my God, that was me. I just sit in those AA meetings and sit there in my throne of contempt and judge everybody. You know, I just pick you apart. If you said something I agreed with, you were brilliant, but you were probably going to be drunk before the week's out. Uh, And I'd sit there and tear you apart. And I'd sit there and just look at the speakers. Is that a toupee? 
Mm. Oh, she's she's cute. Are those real? Um, oh no! Listen to this guy. He sounds like a Hallmark card in a recovery bookstore. Stop it! So I remember sitting in meetings. I just judge all. Oh, and, and the slogan slingers. Oh, I just made me nuts. I mean, I remember one time feeling like I was being stoned to death by refrigerator magnets just from a recovery bookstore. One day at a time. First things first. Let go and let go. Just stop. Stop. Would you? Stop. And what's that about? See, my ego is more has a greater survival mechanism. It will use all my powers of, of cognizant thought to judge you and push you aside and discount you because it will do whatever is necessary to protect its status quo and stay in charge. My ego does not want to give nothing up. And it's it's hideous. If I if I ever if I ever die of alcoholism, if I ever drink again, you can bet that I filled up and stayed entrenched with me for a sustained period of time. And I fill up with me. Don't don't get me wrong, I have not gotten free of this stuff. What I am because of the chronic nature of alcoholism is I'm like the back of a toilet tank. You can flush it and it empties right out and I just start filling up with me. You know, I just start filling up with me again. And that's why I think I will always have to have a sponsor. That's why I have to ask myself those questions on page 86 every evening. I have to try. I'm not good at, I'm not good at step 10. You know, cause step 10's right now. And you're, it's, you continue to watch for this stuff. Well, I get my little plans and designs going on the day and I get a little agitated by something and I just roll over it. Cause I, it's, I got something else to do. I don't have time now to see where I possibly could be out of line because it re- and besides it really looks more like it's you that's out of line. And, and I just roll over it. When, if you roll over it, you get weird and stuff builds up and it's leaks through, it seeps through the cracks and Thank God for the nightly, even with the nightly self-examinations, part of step 11, I still get stuff slipped through the cracks. I still get full of myself, but man, I'm very lucky. I I stay in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. When you sponsor guys and you do service and you have commitments in A and you're an everyday member of AA, you immerse yourself in, in in, in a fellowship that if you don't Take your own inventory. We'll do it for you. <laughs> We're glad to do it. I mean, we'll we'll line up <laughs> and do it. Or sometimes we do it. God does it through you. How many times? How many hundreds and hundreds of times I've been messed up and not known I'm full of myself and not known I'm judgmental and not known I'm back in ego and trench. And I'll go to a meeting and there'll be some guy there talking about himself and it's like. Oh my God, that's what I'm doing. That's me. I couldn't see me by looking at me, but I could see me by listening to you. Isn't that a bizarre thing? That's the beauty of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because when you're sharing about you, you're not trying to tell me nothing about me. So my defenses are down. My ego's not on the defense. It doesn't have the walls up. And all of a sudden, the truth is coming through. And I'll light up. It that lights me up. I've been lit up like that so many times. Where I can, I listen to you and I learn about me. And so I stay in the middle of this. I have to. I used to, you know, there's people in Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I believe, and they're welcome here. And I'm, this is not a, a negative thing. I, I think there are people here who have acute alcoholism. For the most part, Once they were detoxed and were restored to physical stability without alcohol and drugs, they've been kind of good ever since. I'm not that guy. And I, but I would sit in meetings and, and, and if if you're, if you're ego driven and you don't want to change, then, and you're like me, you're kind of a, you're probably a minimalist. Here's what a minimalist does, who doesn't really want to change, you just want relief. You'll sit in, you'll sit in meetings and you'll be talking to yourself and you'll go, Oh, for God's sakes, I can't keep doing this. I, 
I got to do some. I got to do some AA. And, all right, what's what's the absolute minimum I got to do here? <laughs> and I'd, I'd look around. I'd see some guy who says things like, "Oh, I just check in once a week. Don't really need a sponsor. God's my sponsor." How's that work? I mean, that's a good theory, isn't it? But when, when I really need direction the most, is there's, I go inside me, I don't run into God, I run into a whole bunch of me, is what I run into. When I need God the most, I, my, in, my God consciousness is compromised. That's why I will always need a sponsor. That's a, one of the beauties of Alcoholics Anonymous is we're not all sick on the same day. You know, I can be really depressed and full of myself and all, just, oh, I'm a mess here. And you're not. And God will talk through you. Or, you know, it's even amazing. And I've had this, I've had been having really bad days and a sponsee will call me up and I got my head up my butt and he's in pain and he needs help. And all of a sudden it's like, And God just starts talking through me. And then I'm done and I'll go right back into my butt again. Just really. <laughs> But we, we relieve each other of the bondage of self. That's the, the beauty of that. I, I think Alcoholics Anonymous in, the, in this process of, of, of the three legacies of unity being a part of the community, the herd. Doing whatever is necessary to be one with rather than the judgmental one apart from. Having unity here. My personal recovery depends upon a unity. That means I've got to be one of you guys. No matter what the price. Bill said in the book, it says a price must be paid. It means the destruction of self-centeredness. Oh, not that. I think to, to stay in Alcoholics Anonymous, yeah, I have to continually push myself aside. And service, that I, I show up, I have commitments, I do those commitments, that my integrity is tied up in doing what I say I'm going to do. Even if it's inconvenient, even if I'd rather do this other thing, I do what I said I was going to do here. Because I don't want to be the guy who feels like he's a phony. Right? And then the 12 steps in recovery that I have to, the 12 steps in my life have been over the years designed to do one thing, is to shrink Bob. It's, it's massive ego reduction. If, if, if you follow the process in the big book, and that's fourth step, I've never, I've studied a lot of therapy, I've studied a lot of psychology and uh, spirituality, I've read a lot of books, I have never seen anything on the planet, anywhere in print, anywhere, anywhere, that is more effective for ego reduction, is what, and that's what hap- Harry Tebow says, we have to have ego reduction of depth than our fourth step. I mean, when you think about it, it's, it's, it's brilliant. You know, if you, ever, if you ever read the letters and the things about when Bill Wilson wrote this part of chapter 5, God, did, God wrote it. He said he, he was blocked. He couldn't write it. He went into meditation. He said, he, said, he said all of a sudden the pen had a life of its own. He had writer's block. It just started writing itself. And that, that's an amazing process because they kind of trick you into, they, they trick my ego into ego reduction. They asked me to, to make a list of resentments. You know, everybody who's an idiot. There's there's a lot. Everybody, if there was any justice in the universe, would owe me an immense. All the people I feel smugly superior to. The stupid people. The wrong people. The people that really need straight... You know, put them all, list them all down. And then it walks me through a process and takes me to a place on page 66 after it walks me through this. This stuff's going to kill me it, that I'm prepared to look at this from an entirely different angle. I never did that because when you're when you're right, you never you never want to change your mind when you're right. You know, my ego doesn't want to look at things from an entirely different angle because then it, it won't be right. And it's asking me to realize how the person who had wronged me was perhaps like me. And even though I didn't like their symptoms, that they were spiritually sick things they did in column number two and how these affected me or disturbed me that I must realize. I must get honest enough with myself. I must come down off the high horse 
and see how the person I judged so harshly was was really perhaps like me, spiritually sick. That he, This person has been driven by a lot of the fears and, a, and a hurt. Because hurt people will hurt people. That this guy really is me on a very bad day. And when I start to see myself in, in you, all of a sudden it's funny, it's, it's, it's some of the separation between me and you starts to dissolve away. And I start to understand you. I even started to have some compassion for some of the people I judged so harshly for so long because I started to get it. I started to get it. You know, you couldn't help being the way you were when the when you were the way you were any more than I could help being the way I was when I was the way I was. And I got it. And I started to have compassion. For, I started to be able to sit with their pain. I started getting, I get it, I get it, I get you. And I started, a funny thing happens as a result of that. As I started to, to cut you some slack and try to understand you and take you off, to the, off the hook, an amazing thing happened that years of therapy could not do for me, is that I started to take myself off the hook because I took you off. See what I was giving. I was what I was giving to you. I was getting from me, and it's that's what it says in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses, as implied the connected process. As I forgive those, you, you want to stop being depressed. You want to stop beating yourself up. You want to stop being full of self pity. Stop beating others up. Stop judging them so harshly. And that's that. You taught me that I would have never got that. I, it's it's such an amazing turnaround. For a guy like me, I got I have an alcoholic mind. Uh, that's why I stay in the middle of this. Bill says something that I think is very funny in our in the twelve steps and twelve traditions. He says at one point, he says, "You know, we've been talking to you a lot about problems," and then he says a funny thing. He says, "Well, that's because we are problem people." I have a friend who says he says I'm a golf person. He just thinks obsessed with golf. That's all he does, and he's all he looks for is golf opportunities to see golf, opportunities to play golf, opportunities to buy golf stuff. He's a golf person. I'm a problem person. <laughs> Did you ever see that movie Sixth Sense where that little kid walks around and says, "I see dead people. I see problems. They, I see problems where they don't exist." But but you can if you you can tell they're about to they're about to bloom any second now. <laughs> And you see, my ego, uh, this thing that I'm trying to get my life out of the hands of, that I'm in the bondage of, it thrives and is only significant when it has problems. And if there aren't any problems, it will make some up. It doesn't matter. It has to be an action because it has to have something to play God with. And maybe the great, maybe the great awakening here is that there really never was, is not, and never will be anything wrong. What if everything was perfect through your whole life and you were just asleep in your head in the daydream of how it wasn't and all along it was perfect? My sponsor used to do that to me. He used to do this some kind of spiritual jujitsu thing with me when I was new. I'd be panicking about stuff and I'm going to lose my apartment. And he'd always he'd say, he said, Bob, is everything okay right this second? Like, yeah, right there. But by next week, man, I'm telling you, it's going to be that. No, and he'd say, whoa, 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 whoa. Is everything okay right this second? Yeah, yeah, right this second. He said, good, 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 good. He said, when it's no longer right, good, right this second. He said, you and I will have something to work with here. But let's stop solving problems that haven't occurred yet. Let's stop trying to clear up the wreckage of your future. And let's just, right here, right now. And he's trying to bring me into the great reality that it talks about on page 50, the great reality. That's where you are. That's where God is. That's where the love is. It's not in my head. Paradise in the Garden of Eden is right here. It always was. I'm just in my head imagining what's wrong. It's always been perfect right now.
Thank you for my life.